Hello, and welcome to today's TABC Talks edition. My name is Josh Alexander, and I'm the Austin Audit Regional Supervisor. And today I'll be your host for the discussion on festivals and sponsorships. The following guidance was developed to improve internal and external communications and ensure more consistent application of the TABC statutes and rules. This guidance reflects appropriate processes, requirements, and interpretations based on general situations presented herein. This guidance may not apply to every situation, so if you have questions about this guidance or how it applies to a specific circumstance, we advise that you contact uh, TABC directly. Again, as I mentioned, you can interact with um, you know, the presentation by using that uh, chat feature located in the toolbar at the bottom of the presentation. We'll address all those questions at the end. Uh, and if you experience any technical issues, um, we ask that you visit Zoom's Help Center at HTTPS and then support.zoom.us forward slash HC. Today's edition of TBC Talks is going to cover uh, festivals, public events, and sponsorship related to um, these public events and festivals. I want to go over um, how to recognize you know, whether or not you need a license or permit for a given event. Go over the different types of uh, temporary licenses uh, and or permits, as well as uh, catering certificates. Look at what um, means to receive sponsorship and what that sponsorship is and then take a look at um, events that are licensed that contain sponsorship as well as unlicensed events containing sponsorship and then examine the impact of a venue's uh, licensure status and then look at some uh, examples that are common in the marketplace uh, and then we'll kind of wrap up uh, with the summary. So events with a cash bar require a permit or license. Uh, this is the most common way to determine, um, you know, if alcohol is being sold, if there's a immediate exchange um, from one hand to the other of cash in order to get alcohol, then obviously uh, you would need a permit or license of some sort. Events with an entry fee uh, in order to access an open or free bar uh, also will require also will require um, a permit because in that regard alcohol is being sold even if they're just accepting um, the cash upon entry. If that cash is required in order to obtain the alcohol then we consider um, that to need a permit. Uh, events with an entry fee uh, and an open bar may not necessarily require a permit if any responsible adult can request and receive alcohol without paying that entry fee. So in that regard, uh, the exchange in cash would be for, you know, some other um, uh, offerings that the event has and may not necessarily be, uh, you know, tied to the alcohol sale itself. So any adult in that instance should be able to walk up to that event and you know request um, an alcoholic beverage and, and if it's offered to that individual then they may not necessarily be considered uh, selling alcohol even though there's a ticketed entry. So the one uh, thing to note is again um, in this instance it, it doesn't require admitting the person into the event per se uh, but merely bringing the requested uh, beverage to the person at the entrance would be sufficient in terms of determining uh, whether there's a permanent license that's going to be required. And then obviously events with no entry fee or no cash bar, there's no exchange in monies, uh, but there's alcohol being provided at the event, 
uh, simply viewed as um, an event that doesn't require a permit or license because alcohol is not being sold in that uh, instance. This is uh, just a, a diagram that kind of lays out, um, hopefully, a, a, you know, kind of a flow of uh, questions that you can ask yourselves in terms of trying to determine whether a certain event uh, would need a license or you know not need a license or permit. And so you could ask yourself as the host, obviously, um, you know, will the event be involving alcohol? Uh, and if it is, you know, is there some sort of do donation or is it a cash bar? Those sort of things as, as we discussed in the previous slide. Uh, and this flowchart just kind of describes that slide uh, and it'll help to give you a visual, um, you know, diagram of, of trying to figure out whether or not a permit or license is needed. Again, um, if alcohol is being sold and a permit is required, uh, then we're, we lay out here in this slide the uh, statute that requires uh, a permit or a license um, for those events. And so obviously liquor is defined as distilled spirits, wine, and, and malt beverages above 4% alcohol by weight. And you can find that provision in section 1101 of the Alcoholic Beverage Code um, that authorizes a permit to be uh, issued for liquor and then um, for beer, uh, that section would be 61.01, uh, which requires a license for the sale of beer, uh, which is defined as uh, anything 4% or less alcohol by weight. And if alcohol is donated by an alcohol industry member, uh, meaning a wholesaler or manufacturer, someone that holds a permit um, here with TABC, it cannot be sold uh, if it's a permitted venue. So in that instance, uh, the alcohol must be picked up from um, the donated industry uh, member by event representatives, you know, if there's not a permit there, uh, and the donating industry member may not be present in official capacity to promote uh, its products or facilitate the administering of alcohol, and again, that's if you're going to be uh, providing donated alcohol and there's no permit uh, attached to the venue. The types of um, different temporary permit and licenses um, include a temporary uh, mixed beverage permit, which is um, basically allows the consumption of mixed beverages. Uh, it's issued uh, only to the holder of a mixed beverage permit and or a charitable or civic organization. Uh, there's a temporary wine and beer retailer's permit uh, under this uh, BH or HP, which allows for on or off premise consumption of beer, malt liquor and wine up to 17%. It's issued only to a, a mixed beverage permit holder or wine and beer retailer or nonprofit historic preservation um, organization that's been in existence for at least 30 years. And on those, um, that's the specific designation for the uh, HP. And then there's a special three day wine and beer permit that's exclusive to uh, nonprofit and charitable or civic uh, religious organizations that allows the sale of wine, uh, beer, and malt liquor, um, again, uh, for three days. Uh, there's a temporary auction permit, which allows the auction or, if you will, sale of alcoholic beverages, um, if such beverages have been approved for sale um, by a local option election in that area. Uh, and then those uh, temporary auction permits are issued to nonprofit 501 um, C3 or other or another uh, political action committee. And then there's a daily temporary uh, private club permit, which, um, you know, pretty much allows the sale of alcoholic beverages uh, and it's issued to um, private club uh, registrations. Uh, for events that are sponsored by political associations, charitable organizations, you know, fraternal organizations, and so forth and so on. Um, 
No more than two of those uh, daily temporary private clubs can be issued in the same year uh, for events sponsored by the same party. And then you have finally uh, a temporary catering certificate, uh, which is issued only to holders of mixed beverage permits and is really just a subsidiary permit to that uh, mixed beverage and therefore considered an extension of the permitted premise. And so it allows a mixed beverage holder to temporarily sell mixed beverages away from the primary premises, but only in areas designated um, wet for those mixed beverages. And uh, similar to the mixed beverage permit, uh, you can't allow alcohol to, uh, or outside alcohol to enter the premise and you can't allow alcohol to leave the premise. Um, liquor or products sold or served at the catered events must be purchased in the county of the primary mixed beverage and it's valid for a period of up to 10 days. Uh, keep in mind that for uh, retailers utilizing the catering certificate, a beverage cartage permit uh, is required for that holder in order for them to transport the alcohol to and from the event. And any catering certificates issued uh, will require a letter of authorization from the party in control of the actual premise or um, event location where the certificate is being um, applied to. A temporary license uh, or permit or catering certificate, uh, again, may not be issued for an event on a licensed premise uh, with the exception of that temporary auction permit and or uh, if the area uh, basically uh, has a diagram portions of it that may not be considered part of the licensed premise. Um, also, uh, catering certificates may not be issued for events on a location or locations that are under protest uh, regarding their uh, license or permit application or events where um, a location has had a suspended uh, permit or license for some enforcement action. If you want a temporary or a certificate for an event uh, held at a licensed or permitted uh, location, um, it's advised that you work with TABC to diagram uh, the event so that it does not overlap with the licensed or permitted, uh, permitted portions of the premise. And in this regard, uh, may require, you know, some sort of a, again, a relational diagram to be submitted um, to the commission. And uh, we may follow up with a formal review or interview of those um, diagram premises and any other issues uh, containing to the event, such as, you know, sponsorships or control issues uh, and so forth and so on. And then the last thing is, um, you know, temporary uh, catering certificates and or um, permits or licenses for temporary basis uh, must be submitted to the commission at least 10 business days before the event uh, in order to avoid expedited processing fees, which range from uh, $300 to $900, depending on the um, amount of time uh, that you submit it within the, the time frame for the event. And you can see a schedule of the expedited processing fees uh, under the you know, TABC administrative rules. And I've included um, the various sections uh, for full details. Sponsorships. Um, it's basically a form of support provided by an entity, often in exchange for the promotion or advertisement of trade names, trademarks, and or product brands owned by the sponsor. There's different uh, ways that uh, industry members can provide sponsorship, um, and I've included a few here um, that range from obviously uh, financial support, uh, different types of equipment, uh, personnel, or any other types of resources that uh, event organizers uh, can use to, to benefit in putting on an event, uh, such as stages or marketing materials, et cetera. So let's take a look at um, licensed events that contain sponsorship. 
So if an alcohol industry member, uh, again, such as a wholesaler, Texas wholesaler manufacturer is providing sponsorship for an event that does require a license, we consider that to be a, a permitted uh, location, then um, the license host may not receive sponsorship or benefit directly or indirectly uh, unless the event is on a public entertainment facility or the holder is a nonprofit. And that addresses the indirect part. Um, obviously, a you know permit holder can't directly uh, benefit, uh, receive anything of value from uh, an upper tier member. Um, unless again, you know, you're talking about the nonprofit situation where uh, they may receive cash or in-kind uh, donations. Um, uh, there also should be an unlicensed nonprofit or, or 501c3 or some sort of charitable organization that's going to benefit from the event uh, in order for the event to receive sponsorship and that nonprofit should be advertised in conjunction uh, with the event on any you know marketing flyers or um, online you know advertising or any type of media um, where the public or it's clear to the public rather uh, that there's a benefiting uh, nonprofit that's gonna, um, you know, be the recipient of, you know, basically the benefit for the sponsorships provided. Um, you may not sell or provide donated alcohol at the event. Again, we're talking about uh, licensed or permitted events. Um, you may allow the sponsoring industry member uh, to be present to promote their brands in accordance with the law. Um, and then, you know, non-alcohol industry members um, that sponsor events at a licensed event uh, generally is lawful. And so, uh, as an example, um, you know, you're talking uh, any entity or business, um, you know, that doesn't or is not involved in the alcoholic beverage industry. Uh, now let's take a look at the unlicensed events. Uh, that contain sponsorship. So if an unlicensed uh, uh, event contains sponsorship from a Texas wholesaler or manufacturer, um, the unlicensed host in this instance may receive sponsorship directly uh, because they, they don't hold a permit. Um, they have the ability to donate in this instance still, you know, all or a portion of proceeds to a charitable uh, organization or nonprofit cause. Um, they can serve alcohol to attendees uh, that were donated by alcohol industry members or um, provided by, you know, the, the organization. Uh, and they can hire, you know, sell a server, certified individuals to serve the alcohol, or they can utilize um, volunteers to serve the alcohol uh, and under this scenario, because the event is unlicensed, uh, the organizers must prohibit industry members, uh, in, including the sponsor, from being able to present uh, or to, to be present or promote or serve their products because um, it's uh, prohibited or they are prohibited from serving products and promoting uh, their products on an unlicensed um, uh, premise. And so again, um, if it's a, a non-alcohol industry member who's sponsoring uh, an unlicensed event, uh, then the sponsorship is lawful. Similar to the previous flow chart, um, this chart uh, attempts to line out all the uh, various questions and options um, to consider uh, whenever you have events that contain sponsorship, um, you know, trying to determine whether or not the event um, is going to require a permit and whether or not the alcohol is uh, going to be donated by an industry member. Um, and it uh, directs you to uh, the guidelines to help you figure out, you know, whether sponsorship can be provided lawfully. And again, um, these issues are complex enough that um, we advise, you know, if you get into uh, questions about sponsorship or any specific event, to contact the local TBC office 
uh, and let us help you uh, provide guidance on the matter. The impact of a venue's licensure status contains the following information regarding uh, events at venues with no pre-existing license or permit, as well as events at a venue where there is a pre-existing license and permit. When there is no pre-existing license or permit, if an event host is not required to have a license or permit, the event is generally legal to conduct without further action. If event host is required to have a license or permit, then I advise you to contact your local TABC office to determine if a diagram is needed to make the event legal. Events being held at a venue that has a pre-existing license or permit where a host um, is conducting activities that do not require a permit or license, similar to the previous point, the event is generally legal, but existing license holder must adhere to all code and rule provisions. However, if the event host is conducting activities that require a license or permit, then the venue may not be able to host the event. Most temporary licenses and permits cannot be issued at a location that already hold a license or permit. So in this regard, it would be vital that you contact your local TABC office to determine whether a license or permit can be issued at the location and whether or not there's some sort of uh, way to diagram that location. So let's look at um, a common example here uh, where there's an unlicensed promoter that organizes a musical concert at an outdoor festival where alcohol is being sold. Uh, so there is a permit at the location and the promoter also wants to have upper tier members provide sponsorship for the event. So maybe they want um, sponsorship dollars to help advertise the event or put on a concert at the event. Uh, but the actual event happens to be licensed. So in order to uh, put this event on uh, in, an, in an area where uh, the actual um, permit holder is not going to violate any uh, laws, then the authorized third party um, must obtain, you know, basically a temporary uh, license permit or catering certificate to sell the alcohol. Um, that's where you get the permit holder there and the event must have a benefiting nonprofit organization in order to receive the sponsorship. And the independent um, permit holder obviously cannot benefit from the sponsorship, but the unlicensed promoter and or the nonprofit affiliated with the event can receive the sponsorship directly. But because the license uh, or the event is licensed, the alcohol may not be donated and any alcohol sold at the event must be purchased legally through the permit that's issued uh, at the event. And again, the one exception is going to be our temporary auction permits. And any upper tier members uh, associated with the event or, you know, that want to participate in the event because the there is a permit there uh, would be allowed to do so uh, and they can participate by um, you know promoting the products there uh, conducting um, you know samplings things of that nature on the licensed premise and the second example has to do with a nonprofit uh, that wants to organize a festival where they're seeking to have donated alcohol uh, served at the event. However, the event's not necessarily free because there's paid entry uh, that is required in order uh, to access you know, the event. Um, and they wanna donate proceeds uh, from the event to a charitable cause. And so in this scenario, Again, uh, the event's technically not licensed, um, so the donated alcohol um, 
obviously um, may not be sold. The alcohol must be provided to attendees for free, uh, which means, you know, again, there doesn't have to be a license or permit issued there uh, with the exception of that um, temporary auction permit, which will allow you to, to basically uh, raffle or, or donate, you know, the alcohol. Uh, alcohol must be made available to any uh, requesting adult uh, from the general public, um, regardless of whether they paid uh, an entry ticket or not. And donated alcohol must be picked up by event organizers and can't be delivered by the donating industry member. And that goes back to uh, the upper tier members authority or distributors authority to deliver alcohol uh, only to licensed um, locations. And upper tier members may not attend um, an event that's unlicensed in official capacity to promote or serve products. In summary, events where alcohol is being sold will require a license or permit. There's basically six different types of licenses or permits as well as a catering certificate that can be issued to events uh, to allow for alcohol sale. A temporary license permit or catering certificate may not be issued on top of an existing licensed premise with the exception of the temporary auction permit and or if the licensed premise is diagrammed where a portion of the premise uh, has been um, uh, taken off of the existing uh, license premise and it, and it doesn't overlap with that license premise, uh, then we may be able to issue one of those temporary uh, permits or licenses uh, to that diagrammed area. And then entities holding a temporary license or permit or catering certificate may not receive sponsorship uh, directly um, from alcohol industry um, with the exception of, again, um, nonprofits and or uh, if it's a public entertainment facility scenario where the unlicensed property owner or lessee of that facility, uh, you know, can engage in uh, sponsorship agreements with the industry. Again, the retailer in that scenario or concessionaire uh, would have to be independent of the sponsorship in order for them to accept uh, the sponsorship. Nonprofit uh, charitable organizations obtaining a temporary license permit may receive a no strings attached or in kind uh, cash donations from industry members. But ultimately, uh, and probably the most important thing is again, if there's going to be industry sponsorship, uh, you know, designated areas for, you know, diagram premises where we're going to have, you know, some portions licensed and some portions not, then uh, it's highly uh, advisable for you to reach out to your local TBC office for guidance. Any questions at this point? Um, you have the group chat here. It doesn't look like we have any questions at this moment or that have been developed. Um, and we'll still give you a few um, you know, minutes here if you got some last minute questions before I sign off. But you can also um, ask questions by sending emails to stakeholder at tabc.texas.gov and we'll answer your questions there. Again, I wanna thank you all for watching. Uh, and in order for us to improve on future uh, talk, TBC Talks presentations, we recommend um, that you send any of your recommendations to um, stakeholder at tbc.texas.gov. And then uh, again, um, also to uh, help improve our um, presentations moving forward, there should be an invitation to a short survey following this presentation. And so it looks like uh, we've got a question here regarding um, how we handle tasting tickets at an event.
can these tasting tickets be reimbursed to wineries? So this is um, kind of a complex issue um, that, uh, that has come up recently. And the best way to uh, explain uh, the answer to that is um, if, if it's an unlicensed organization that's hosting a, an event that is ticketed, uh, the unlicensed uh, event cannot collect the money uh, for the sale of alcohol um, and then, you know, you know reimburse some um, price or cost that they've come up with uh, and take, you know, control of that sale away from the licensed wineries that are out there. So, um, you know, really, as long as the wineries are the ones benefiting from the sale, then uh, you'll be good there. Otherwise, the organizations in those events should be pulling their own temporary or, you know, uh, permit out there so that they can purchase the wine legally and sell those tickets up front. Um, and that's the, the best answer for that. So uh, what is the rule for gift baskets coming in for events as gifts with alcohol not open at the event? That depends on what type of permit is out there. So uh, as I mentioned with the uh, mixed beverage and the daily uh, you know, mixed beverage permits where there's gonna be a control issue, uh, you can't have outside alcohol brought onto those licensed premises. So if that was the case, then you would not be able to bring in gift baskets that have alcohol uh, in them uh, with the exception of if that uh, organization or nonprofit or qualified entity pulls a, um, a temporary auction permit, uh, then you could take those products onto a licensed uh, premise uh, to include a mixed beverage, as long as that you know alcohol is kept separate um, and that event is uh, you know kind of covered, uh, reviewed by uh, the commission. Uh, next question, um, what legally designates a public entertainment facility? So uh, the public entertainment uh, facility uh, is defined in um, 108.75 uh, and that, you know, basically has some criteria there in terms of the type of uh, establishment that it is, um, you know, and has to be, uh, you know, uh, some event that's going to have, you know, musical uh, acts there, uh, theatrical acts and things of that nature. So, uh, and there also has to be an independent concessionaire uh, there that pulls or has the permit and the ability to sell alcohol at those establishments. But, um, you know, take a look at the section for, uh, you know, public entertainment facilities um, in order to see what the actual criteria is. There's also a, um, a way that you can, you know, request for TABC to approve a facility. Uh, however, you know, that, that is optional, um, but we highly recommend that you send those um, requests for any facility that, that you might uh, believe meets the, the definition of a public entertainment facility. And we'll gladly designate that, um, you know, in our records, you know, as well as, um, you know, give you approval to, to move forward as a uh, public entertainment facility so that you don't have potential uh, enforcement issues, um, you know, down the line. And then uh, last question, uh, uh, we're a nonprofit and generally do a three-day temporary permit for our alcohol events. Um, this year, we're looking to have an indoor location. That location has a permit of their own. Would we be able to circumvent permit issues by doing a temporary auction permit? Or can you briefly go over the difference between a temporary auction permit, a three-day uh, festival, and temporary private clubs in regards to nonprofit? So the temporary auction permit is kind of, um, as the name implies, it, it's not intended uh, for it to be a traditional permit that sells alcohol. 
uh, but mostly for you know nonprofit pur purposes or some political uh, action purposes. Uh, there's a permit that the um, uh, code authorizes for those entities to pull uh, where they can auction off alcohol uh, in raffle or, or raffle alcohol in you know, uh, raffle baskets and things of that nature. If you are looking for uh, the ability to bring in alcohol uh, to a licensed premise, I would recommend that you reach out to you know local um, office uh, or myself and, and go over what those details are because there's other questions um, that we got to have answered. Again, you know what type of permit do they hold? If there's a mixed beverage permit there, then they can't receive any uh, or allow any alcohol from the outside to enter their premise. Uh, if it's a beer and wine, um, you know, permit holder, then, you know, there's no restrictions on bringing in outside alcohol, but then you could not, you know, technically sell that alcohol uh, because they, that premise is permitted and that permit holder can only benefit, you know, from alcohol that they legally purchased, et cetera, et cetera. So it's different from an individual bringing an alcohol on the premise who's going to consume that alcohol um, you know, personally, then then that would be lawful on that beer and wine uh, permit. Um, so it really depends on what type of permit they have. And then again, there is an option uh, potentially, depending on the location, that you may be able to designate a portion uh, of that licensed location off the premise, which now makes it unlicensed and then would allow you to possibly pull a uh, temporary permit uh, in that regard for that location. So again, uh, it really just depends on on some details that would require you know further communication um, with you um, uh, and us to make sure that we're giving you the right guidance. And uh, there's another question: What are the guidelines on having a delivery truck at an event? Can you park it somewhere on the grounds? So again, uh, this is a complex uh, answer because it depends on a lot of things uh, like, is the event, um, uh, is it considered a charitable event? Uh, there are sections or provisions in the code that basically allow the agency to relax uh, restrictions, you know, certain advertisement restrictions if the event is considered charitable in nature. And so using that example, uh, if it was a charitable event uh, and it was put on by a nonprofit, um, you know, then there wouldn't be issues with advertising, um, uh, you know, and things of that nature that may be on those delivery trucks uh, within 200 feet of that retail um, license or permit that's issued at the event. So that's one thing. If it's not a charitable event, then there could be issues because there are prohibitions against, um, you know, advertising, um, you know, brands and things like that that are typically found on those uh, delivery trucks, as well as, um, you know, certain uh, types of um, activities that are considered to be benefits from the, you know, middle tier, which would be the distributor to that retailer. So we have in the past, uh, under certain circumstances, have allowed, uh, you know, trucks to park um, park uh, at those events where, you know, there's clear issues of, you know, ingress and egress in terms of, you know, those um, physical abilities for those delivery trucks to get in and out of those locations. And so we have, you know, allowed uh, certain instances like that where we may have, you know, have to just cover up the advertisement on the truck, those sort of things. But again, uh, that question is kind of complex enough that I would advise um, that you contact the TABC office so that we can uh, make sure that we understand under what premise, you know, uh, the trucks are out there, um, you know, for the delivery and whether or not, you know, uh, you know, it's a charitable event and so forth and so on. So that answer could vary uh, just depending on, you know, what the uh, circumstance is. Um, so, you know, without 
Um, any further questions? I, I believe, uh, again, you know, good questions. I, and I recommend uh, and advise you guys, you know, to reach out. Uh, hopefully I provided an answer to those questions, but many of these uh, situations involving events and deliveries and sponsorships and, you know, uh, donated alcohol, uh, all of those things really vary uh, depending on the circumstances. So if you reach out to us, I can get you answers to, you know, uh, your specific circumstance uh, and we can work through those scenarios and make sure that we're giving you um, the best guidance that we can uh, for you to have a successful event. But again, I appreciate everybody for watching. Um, reach out if there's anything else that's needed. My name is Joshua Alexander and uh, we're signing off.